Shalom Israel. This is Judah Yasharel. And I want to say all praises to the Most High Creator forever. I got a special lesson today. And I have to give uh, credit to Sister. Let me see. I want to get her name right. Uh, Curly Sunshine 100. She asked me almost a month ago. Uh, she's a new subscriber. She asked me almost a month ago if I would do a lesson on the feast days and how do we keep them. And I responded to her and I told her that I will look into it. But I want y'all to know something. When I began doing these lessons a few years ago, I did them from my own mind, so to speak. Uh, and I was very uneducated in the spirit. But what I brought was truth. But here's the thing. Even though teachers today bring lessons that are completely true, the question is, is that what the Most High wanted at that time? And when I realized that, I began to stop. And I began to wait. Because when I bring a lesson, I want it to be from the Most High, teaching what He wants you to hear, not what I think you should hear. And this is the difference between what I teach and other teachers. I don't teach history, I don't teach semantics, I don't teach New Testament. But I wait until the Most High either confirms or puts it in my spirit to do this particular lesson. It just so happens that Sister Curly was in exact alignment with the Most High. Her request prompted this lesson because it is from what I can see, what the Most High wanted the people to hear. And this is a big deal. This is something that is, is asked among a lot of our people. And there's so much confusion involving this subject where people are guessing and assuming. So we're going to clear this up today based on what thus saith the Most High. Thank you, Sister Curly. It appears that you and the Most High are working on this together. And he used you to show me this is what he wants the people to hear. So the title of the day, today's lesson is Holy Feast Days. Can we keep them in our captivity? So we'll start out reading, Does the Torah teach that there are specific days the Most High made holy? If so, what are they? And are they still in effect? And did the Most High only intend them for the ancient Israelites? Did JC do away with these days and exchange them for Christmas, Easter, New Year's, and other days of pagan origin? Which days should you keep? Does it matter? Prepare to be shocked by what the Torah really teaches. Most people never reflect on why they believe what they believe or do what they do. In a word filled with popular customs and traditions, few seek to understand the origin of things. Most generally accept common religious practices without question. They don't question the validity. Where did you get it? How do you know? Where is the proof? They don't question. Choosing to do what everyone else does because it is easy, natural, and comfortable. They can be in step. The most follow, most follow along as they have been taught, assuming that what they believe and do is right. They take their beliefs for granted and never take time to prove them. Nowhere is the more true. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Now here is the more true than in the observance of Christmas, Easter, New Year's, Halloween, Valentine's Day, and other supposed Christian holidays. Many millions keep these days without even knowing why or where they originated from. Well, I happen to know. Most suppose that they are found in the Bible because they see millions of professing Christians observing them. Surely hundreds of millions of people cannot be wrong. That's what they think. The, the Torah does in fact mention Christmas and Easter and certain other familiar holidays, but it bluntly condemns them as heathen customs. The proof is overwhelming that these days are traditions and commandments of men, but vast multitudes keep them away anyway, but most, most vast multitudes keep them anyway, seemingly content to worship Christ. They don't even know who Christ is. I don't think they even know what the word Christ means. Since the Torah condemns these universally observed Christianized holidays of men, how did they come up into popular practice? If the Most High once commanded that certain holidays or holy days be kept, then should you not be certain why? You choose not to observe them, no matter how comfortable a lifelong practice may be. Should you not base your decision to continue doing it on proof or hard evidence instead of assumptions? Let's look at Isaiah chapter 66 in verse two. For all those things hath mine hand made and all those things have been, saith the Most High, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of contrite spirit and trembles at my word. Will you sincerely, with an open mind, seek and tremble before the truth of the Most High's word about his holy days? Or will you go along with the masses and their traditions of men's heathen holidays? The denominations of this world will often admit to making a half-hearted effort at keeping nine of the Ten Commandments. Typically, they will acknowledge that it is wrong to steal, kill, covet, bear false witness, and commit adultery. They will also acknowledge that honoring one's father and mother, avoiding idolatry, and taking the Most High's name in vain, while claiming to follow the Most High described in the first commandment are basically good things to do. However, most do a poor job of actually keeping these nine commandments and teach that Christ officially did away with them and kept them for us. I want y'all to really chew on that for a minute. But most will agree, at least tactically, that these nine commandments are nice principles and principles only. Now I want you to consider Exodus chapter 20, verse eight through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the most high, your father. In it thou shalt not do any work thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is in within thy gates. For in six days the Most High made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, is and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Most High blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. Now let's look at Exodus 20 and verse 8 through 11. 
it reveals that Sabbath keeping is the fourth commandment and a fundamental law of the Most High. The Sabbath was hollowed, made into holy time by the Most High at creation. The Most High never authorized or hollowed Sunday, the first day of the week. There was even there was never even a day named Sunday. The days were numbered. They were never named. Sunday was instituted and initialized by the Roman Catholics. But they, they authorized Sunday as the first day of the week, not the Most High. So keep that in mind. Let's look at Exodus chapter 30. And verse 1 through 18. And the Most High spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of the Most High, in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship, to devise cunning works. To work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones to set them and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. And I behold, I have given with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, to the of the tribe of Dan. And in the hearts of all that are wise hearted, I have put wisdom that they may make all that I have commanded thee, or rather, that they shall make all that I have commanded thee. The tabernacle of the congregation and the ark of the testament and the mercy seat that is there upon and all the furniture. Now, I want y'all to pay close attention to these little words right here because they make a big difference. So listen real close real close and and do y'all need to listen to this lesson several times because I promise you you're going to miss something and the ark of the testament and the mercy seat that is there upon and all the furniture of the tabernacle and the table see even the furniture is important and the table and his furniture see this furniture is important I'm going to show you why in just a little bit. And the pure candlestick with all his furniture and the altar of incense. See, there's got to be an altar of incense. How many of you got one of these? I don't have one, and I don't think anybody in these lands of captivity has one either. And the altar of burnt offering with all his furniture and the labor of his foot and the cloth of service and the holy garments. See here? You have to have holy garments. Y'all follow me close. And the cloth of service and the holy garments for Aaron the priest. And the garments of his sons, even his sons, have to have special garments. To minister in the priest's office. Where is your office priest today? Y'all so-called priest. Y'all say y'all are from the royal priesthood. And y'all just appointed yourselves. Y'all appointed yourselves into a position that was taken away. And the anointing of oil and sweet incense for the holy place. Do you have a holy place? Huh? Is it your living room? Your bathroom? What, where is your holy place? According to all that I have commanded, thee shall do. You see what I'm talking about? They're not following commandments. They're following their own thoughts their own ways and most of their ways are mimicked by the traditions of man. According to all that I have commanded thee shall they do. 
Do only what he commanded you to do. Don't go in and in, in, in just throw yourself into a position. Where did you get the commandment? And how can you prove you got it? And the Most High spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Most High that does sanctify you. The Most High is not one who takes his word lightly. Once he speaks it, it's law. Once you break it, you are a criminal. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, thou shall, thou, that soul shall be cut off from, from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Did he say on Sunday? Did he say on Friday sundown? Did he say on Saturday sundown? No. He said, but in the seventh, that's the seventh day, that is telling you that we count from a certain point to get our seventh day. We don't count from a day that was named by the Roman Catholic, such as Sunday. We don't count from there. We count from the new moon. You're going to see that soon. He shall surely be put to death. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Most High made heaven and earth. And on the seventh day he rested. Did he, did he name the seventh day? No. He numbered the seventh day. So how can you know when the seventh day is? You count from the day after the new moon sighting and you will have your seventh day. That is how he did it. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of the Most High. The Most High has always said, remember, Y'all keep this word in mind. The Most High has always said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You can refer to that in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8. He has never said, remember the first day, the pagan's son's day to keep it holy. Let me read that one more time. The Most High has always said, remember the Sabbath day. Sabbath means seven. To keep it holy, he has never said, remember the first day, the pagan's son's day, to keep it holy. Or did he authorize mankind to do this? Nor did he ever command or allow his people to keep numerous other pagan festivals and days of worship he has always commanded against their observance how can you claim you have read the book if you don't know this I can understand newbies people that are just coming into the truth I can understand them but I can't understand those who have claimed to study 20 years plus and they don't know this Daniel Chapter 7 and verse 25 warns of a dominant false leader who will think to change times and laws. Did y'all get that? Daniel 
chapter 7, verse 25 says, and it warns of a dominant false leader who will think to change times and laws. While this specific event is yet ahead, there have been four running types who have taken similar actions. The most obvious ways that churchianity has counterfeited the most high's holy times and laws has been by replacing his Sabbath with the pagan sun's day and even Saturday, Saturn's day, Saturn's day, thus altering his fourth great law. Many speak of Sunday as their Sabbath. That's your Christian church. That's why they're in that house every Sunday. And by replacing his annual holy days with numerous pagan holidays practiced for centuries by who? The Romans and Greeks. Daniel 7.25 warns of a dominant false leader who would think to change times and laws. While this specific event is yet ahead, there has been forerunning types who have taken similar actions. The most obvious ways that churchianity has confirmed counterfeited the most high's holy time and laws has been replacing his sabbath with the pagan son's day thus altering his fourth great law many speak of sunday as their sabbath and by replacing his annual holy days with numerous pagan holidays practiced for centuries by the romans and the greeks but there are other ways that professing Christianity has changed the Most High's way of marking time. Y'all remember this, marking time. It starts the year in the dead of winter. That's how the heathens start their year, January, in the dead of winter. The Most High starts his year in the spring. When nature is springing to life, this ought to get somebody's attention. The woman begins her days in the middle of the night, while the Most High marks days from sunrise to sunset. The Roman religion begins the work week on the second day, which is Monday, as they see it. While the Most High begins the weekly work cycle on the first day of the week, there was no name mentioned, but if we had to mention a name, it would be Sunday. Pagan Rome has devised an unnatural calendar based solely on the sun. Y'all listen to this. Pagan Rome has devised an unnatural calendar based solely on the sun thus having varying lengths for its months. This is why they end up with 28 days and 31 days. And there is no days that has 28 days. There's only 29-day months and 30-day months. That's it. There is no 28-day month. There is no 31-day month. This is how they got you. Now listen carefully. Based on based solely on the sun, thus having varying lengths for its months, while the Most High bases his calendar on the moon and starts months with each new moon. Is that not what I've been teaching? The Most High's sacred calendar generally referred to as the Hebrew calendar. That's who he gave it to has never been recognized by religionists, scientists, historians, and educators as the way the Most High intended to mark and measure time. Remember when I taught y'all that the moon is based on movement. Time is based on movement. Both are based on nature. The solar is not. Scientists, historians, and educators as the way of the Most High intended to mark and measure time. 
The Jews did not invent this calendar or contrive it from imagination. Its principles go back to the first chapter of the Torah, where the sun and the moon were appointed for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Now, these seasons are your holy feast days. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. No other calendar harmonizes the solar and lunar cycles. Only the Hebrew calendar sanctioned by the Most High does this. Y'all think I'm playing around. I'm bringing you the truth. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 23. It is best described as and is often called the Holy Day chapter. It contains a brief description of each of Most High's seven annual holy days, also called feast or Sabbaths, which we will see are interchangeable terms throughout the chapter. We will later examine the meaning of these days. Notice, and the Most High spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feast of of the Most High, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. What does that mean? Commanded assemblies. Now, how many of us can assemble with a nation of Israel when we don't even really know who they are? You can't walk down the street and say, oh, that's an Israelite right there. Oh, that's one right now because Ham looked just like us, almost. So this is saying Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feast days of the Most High, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. That means you shall gather and assemble together. How many of y'all's priests that are on YouTube today have y'all gathered with? Over the internet don't count. It has to be a physical presence. Even these are my feast. That's verse 1 and 2. And verse 3 introduces the weekly Sabbath as one of the Most High's feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day, what? The seventh? Not Saturday. The seventh day counting from the day after the new moon sighting is the seventh day. All these are numbered. They are not names. These names came from pagan Roman Catholics. They are pagan gods. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation, assemblies. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Most High in all your dwellings. Verse 4 introduces the rest of the Most High's feast. These are the feasts of the Most High, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. It has to be done at the right time. You cannot guess you cannot assume you have to be on point. That is just the way it is. Now the question is, did the house of Israel keep the feast days in exile? Well, according to the scripture, the answer is no. Whether you are from the seed of Jacob or Gentile grafted into Israel. Now let me explain what it means by a Gentile grafted into Israel. A lot of Israelites during this time were scattered throughout pagan nations and they were forced to live like the pagans or die. So they eventually morphed into keeping the Gentile laws and their ways, which the Mosai saw them as Gentile, but they were Israel. They had went astray. So if you grow up, this is just an illustration. If you grow up an innocent person from childhood to your early 20s, and then one day you decide to rob a bank, you have went from an innocent person into now what is called a bank robber. But does it change your nationality? 
No, it changes the definition of what you are, not who you are. And a lot of our people get this screwed up because they don't know that when the Most High mentions Gentile in a lot of instances, he's talking about his lost people who are finding their way into pagan rituals, rites, and commandments. Their laws. The instructions apply to Israel, the olive tree as a whole. See what I'm talking about? Scripture foretells that the Israelites were in Babylon, exiled, give or take 300 years, and there is no record of one Israelite in Scripture performing any duties, offerings, or gatherings in reference to any of the holy feast days. Why? Because they would have been killed. Why? Because the Most High said explicitly, these shall be kept in the land where I have placed my name. He didn't place his name in the Ukraine. He didn't place his name in America. He didn't place his name in Russia and so forth and so forth. Only in Jerusalem, which he has destroyed. The Jerusalem they claim today is fake. The new Jerusalem that's coming, which is now hidden, is the true Jerusalem and that's where he placed his name. So if he told you to do this in the land where he placed his name, what gives you the right to do it in another land? As per Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Zechariah were in Babylon exile and there is no record of them preparing, gathering, and or acknowledging the holy feast day in a foreign land. Did y'all get that? According to Israelite custom, it was required that the Israelites to observe the holy feast day in the city that the Most High placed his name. Let me highlight that for y'all. It was required to observe the holy feast days in the city that the Most High placed his name. As scripture will display the spoken command and acknowledgement of keeping feast days only in Jerusalem. Find that in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 5 through 7. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 15 to 16. And Zechariah 14 and 15 through 18. And Tobit chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. From the Most High spoken word, he has placed his name in the city that he chose. Not you. He chose you cannot choose, which is Jerusalem. And again, I will tell you, he destroyed the original Jerusalem and he is bringing a new Jerusalem. What does that tell you? How can you keep a holy feast day in a land that has not been returned to you or a land that has not come yet? Do you get my point? Why is nobody teaching this? You can find reference to this in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 36, 2 Kings chapter 21, and verse 4. As were in the Gregorian year of 2011, Jerusalem today is not yet restored. Y'all remember this. Nor does Jerusalem have a temple, and the house of Israel has no priest. Let's take one holy feast day as an example according to its requirements. Let's take one holy feast day as an example according to its requirements. In Leviticus chapter 16 verse 29 through 34 and Levi chapter 23 verse 27 to 32 is in reference to day of atonement according to these scriptures 
What is required is a priest. A temple. And an offering to be offered up unto the priest. I don't have to tell y'all. There is no such thing today. Y'all know it. Well, the ones that have their eyes open, they know it. But those idiots who are deep in the Christianity and JC, they don't know it. They can't see it and they can't hear it. But these, according to these scriptures, what is required is a priest, a temple, and an offering to be offered unto the priest. And he, as he, will make atonement for Israel. Who does this? The priest has to make this atonement for Israel. Now, let me ask you something. How can you know for sure that your so-called priest has made an atonement for the nation of Israel if you're not there? You see, this is a physical act. You have to witness this. It has to be witnessed by the people. He will make the house of Israel today is scattered throughout the four corners of the earth and does not have a temple or a priest. My goodness, people. This is really not that hard. And it, it, it just behooves me to see all of these people out here on YouTube teaching that they are from the royal priesthood. We barely know if we are Israel or not. So how in the world can you know for a fact that you are from the house of Levi? Plus, on top of that, you don't have any of the requirements that is necessary to perform these rites as a priest. He will make the house of Israel today is scattered throughout the four corners of the earth and does not have a temple or a priest. So do we keep the holy feast days, including day of atonement in exile in a land where the Most High did not place his name? Do we go according to man's version on how to keep the feast days or do we keep the feast days according to written scriptural instructions there is however a judaic religious ritual called kaparat which takes place on the eve of the day of atonement these are the jewish these are the people over in the fake jew and the fake jerusalem which only requires listen to this either a chicken or a bag of coins the person swings a live chicken or a bundle of coins over one's head three times, symbolically transferring one's sins to the chicken or to the coins. The chicken is then slaughtered and donated to the poor for consumption. The kaparat ritual, of course, is nowhere supported in scripture, but it is a Judaic religious ritual which brings to the conclusion on how an individual from the house of Israel decides on how to keep the day of atonement, whether it be according to scripture or man's made tradition. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm gonna do what the Most High said. He said, you keep these in the land where I place my name, in the city where I place my name. Well, he took that away from us. He destroyed Jerusalem, and he is now promising to bring a new Jerusalem, which completely verifies that there is no Jerusalem, even though the fake Jews are proclaiming the fake Jerusalem is the true land, which is not. So how do we keep the feast days? Well, I have one suggestion, and it goes right back to the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. 
Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. 99% of all of our feast days that are required of us to keep requires a priest. Not a self-appointed priest, but a, a priest appointed and anointed by the Most High, just like they did back then. Malachi 3 and 6, the Most High does not change. The way he did it then is the way it's done now. Because we are in captivity, it's not here. You are not a priest. You are a liar. And anybody listening to you is a liar. So no, you cannot keep the majority of the feast days. You can acknowledge some of those requirements, such as, don't do any work on that Sabbath day. Don't uh, uh, leave your home or carry anything in your home or out of your home or leave your gates. Don't do any of these things and eat, drink, and rest. You can do those because they don't require a priest. But everything else, you have to have a priest. There is no priest today. Go back over this lesson as many times as you need and look up the scriptures that I gave. Verify. See if I didn't bring the facts. Shalom. Much love, Israel.